Moxie? Oh, Your tea? Yes. Your tea, madam. Your tea, madam. Mrs. Fanny, Roth to bait. What happened? What is it, child? It's madam and the colonel. Something awful is going on. I can't open the door. Here, let me try. Stop here. Both of you. Mrs. Barclay? Mrs. Barclay, open the door! as well and there's no key i'm going out for a doctor and the police <laughs> dr john watson Formerly medical officer attached to the Royal Berkshire's now in civilian practice. Murphy, second in command, temporarily in charge of the Royal Mallows following the uh, tragedy of our Colonel's death. And this will be Mr. Holmes. Uh, please. It's good of you to come so swiftly. Not at all. I've explained to Holmes how concerned you must be about the possibility of a scandal. Thank you. The honor of the regiment is in my care. And yet, the newspaper's reports suggest that a scandal is inevitable. Well, surely not. I've done my utmost to make sure that reporters were kept as far away as possible. Exactly, and that is what has made them suspicious. They scent a mystery. That much is clear from the little they have been able to say. Well, surely it would be wrong to, re to repeat to draw attention to, to... Quite. You see how much we need your help, Mr. Holmes. What do you say, Holmes? What can I say? Major Murphy, you have told me nothing! I have come down here after persuasion from my friend to Aldershot who has more interest in military matters than I. Now that I am here, please, tell me the facts. The commanding officer of this regiment, Colonel James Barclay, was found dead in his villa at about 10 o'clock the night before last. The body was found by Private Bates, his batman, lying in the morning room. There was a ragged cut two inches long in the back of his head, which had evidently been caused by a violent blow from a blunt instrument. And upon the floor by the body was a, a singular hand-carved wooden club. Also, stretched out on the sofa, lying in a dead faint, was Nancy, ba Mrs. Barclay. Please continue, Major Murray. The servants had been alerted to the tragedy by the sounds of a quarrel between the Colonel and Mrs. Barclay. They tried to enter the morning room but found it locked. Bates had to go round by the garden and get in through the French windows. And I suspect Mrs. Barclay. Yes, but she is quite incapable of such a dreadful act. I have been the late Colonel's second in command for a number of years. I've come to know Nancy Barclay well. Of course. Tell me about Colonel Barclay. Was he highly regarded by the men under his command? Considering his background, remarkably so. His background? Why? Was he ever disgraced? No. But it's not generally known outside that Jim Barclay began his career as a private soldier in the Mallows. Did he indeed? 
from private soldier to commanding officer in the same regiment. That's a rare achievement. It was his gallantry in the Indian mutiny that got him his commission. And then quite rapid promotion over the years. More rapid than mine, for instance. Impressive. And I suppose the unfortunate Mrs. Barclay's in custody? No. Not exactly, no. She's in hospital being looked after, with a police constable standing by. Nancy Barclay is a handsome woman now. But you should have seen her as a young girl in India 30 years ago. She was a daughter of the regiment. Her father was the regimental son major, RSM Devoy, and therefore quite a formidable father-in-law for any soldier. I remember that all the men in my company thought her quite the prettiest girl in the garrison. As a junior officer, I had little to do with her, but I was aware that she was a most charming, most vivacious and spirited girl. It was quite understandable that Barclay was not the only man in the regiment who sought her hand. But in the end, he was the one she chose. Bertie, not far from Cornpaw, a few months after the besieged garrison there was relieved by General Neal's column in the summer of 1858. Shortly after the marriage, Sergeant Barclay got his commission as expected. Must have been difficult for the Barclays at first. NCO promoted from the ranks, married to a regimental sergeant major's daughter. Yes, I believe there was some little social fiction, but Nancy carried it off with dignity and charm, and they gained acceptance in no time. Barclay's career flourished, and the regiment returned from India some five years ago. Barclay was then appointed commanding officer. And the marriage continued to be a happy one. It appeared to be so. Appeared. Most people believed the marriage to have been a uniformly happy one. And what do you believe, Major Murphy? My position as second in command often took me to the Barclays' house. I saw a different side to the marriage. The truth is more important than loyalty to your late commander. The one night I'd been dining at the Barclays, and it wasn't until I reached the end of the drive that I realized I'd left my cigar case in the dining room. I went back. The front door was still open. Jane, the maid, was in the hall. I'm glad you're still here. I've left my cigar case on the table. I think the Colonel and Mrs. Barclay have gone to bed, sir. Oh, for goodness sake, James! Confess that! Who is it? Who? Let go of me! You are hurting me. Tell me you love me, then. Me and nobody else. Do you hear? Do you hear me? Oh, would I have married you if I didn't? I don't know. Sometimes I wonder. And this expression of jealousy occurred within seconds of you, Major Murphy, leaving the Barclays' heart. Tell me about the Colonel. Was he a violent man in any way? On occasion, he could be most vindictive towards young subalterns. But he'd clawed his way to the top. You need to be ruthless to do that. You mentioned a carved wooden club found by the body. One of the Colonel's Indian souvenirs. I believe the servants deny ever having seen this club before. Certainly, I've never seen it on any of my visits. It was, it was quite long. And the police? I suppose, had retained it for examination. Yes. They believe it to be the murder weapon. Do they indeed? Do I think we should begin by visiting the Barclays' house. Unless, of course, it is possible to interview Mrs. Barclay. I'm afraid she's still unconscious. I thought as much.
If there had been anything between Major Murphy and Mrs. Barclay, would he have related the incident of his forgotten cigar case? It was about half past seven, sir, and I was waiting at table. Once a month, Mrs. Barclay spent the evening doing charity work in Aldershot. Where are you off to, Sir Harry? Well, the distribution of old clothing starts at eight o'clock. And I promised Anne Morrison I'll be at the Mission Hall on time. Well, if you want to catch some filthy disease from a lot of flea-ridden diner nights, I suppose that's your affair. I believe in putting back into life as much as one gets out of it. We've been fortunate with our lot. Others haven't been so lucky. Don't be laid back. Of course not. Mrs. Barclay must have returned about quarter past nine, sir. I was in the kitchen helping the cook with the dishes. There was thunder in the distance, and I was just saying to Mrs. Fenning that there was a storm brewing when the morning room bell rang. I came up here to find that Mrs. Barclay had returned. She was walking up and down this room, sir. Very pale, upset. She looked awful, sir. 